Hello, everyone. What a fun song that was. Well, welcome to this event tonight. Uh, I'm Cindy Chadwick. I'm the County Librarian at Alameda County Library, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our closing event of the Alameda County Reads for this wonderful book, Eat Joy. Thank you so much to our community members here in Alameda County for participating in this event over the last several months. It was really an experiment on our parts to try to bring together the community during this um, incredible year we've just had and a difficult time for many people. So thank you all for being part of our experiment. I also wanna say a quick thank you to our team at Alameda County Library, all the librarians, the managers, the people all over who participated in and led this program in front of the camera, hosting programs, as well as behind the scenes. And the two people at the top of that list have to be Chris Selig and Don Balistrieri from our Castor Valley Library. It was really Chris and Don's leadership over these many months of planning and implementation that made this possible. So kudos to you, Chris and Don, and thank you so very much. Before I introduce our panelists for tonight, um, I'd like to just mention that while the chat is disabled on this Zoom call, the Q&A function is active. And we've got Chris here behind the scenes actively monitoring the Q&A. And so please feel free to submit your questions. We'll try to get a couple out um, before the end of the program. And we also have some raffle prizes to give away tonight. So that'll happen at the end. So please stick around. Um, Chris will be picking someone to choose those raffle prizes. And we'll have some um, great treats from our authors as well as uh, some local goodies. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, joining me tonight is Natalie Eve Garrett. She is an artist, writer, and the editor of Eat Joy. She's also the editor of the Artist and Writer's Cookbook, a collection of stories with recipes. And Natalie is joining us from Maryland. Welcome, Natalie. Hi, thank you so much. Next, we have Rakesh Satyal. He's the author of Bake Your Fear, the story in the Eat Joy collection. He is an executive editor at HarperCollins Publishers. He is the author of the novels Blue Boy and No One Can Pronounce My Name. Rakesh is joining us from Brooklyn. Welcome, Rakesh. Thank you so much. Thank you. You, did, you, you lived up to the book title. I mean, you didn't live up to the book title. You, 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 you defied so it. Thank you. Right. Thank you. That was ominous. Yes. So. <laughs> Last but not least, we have Beth Nguyen. Beth is the author of the story Spaghetti and Books in the Each Way Collection. She is also the author of three books, the memoir Stealing Buddha's Dinner and the novels Short Girls and Pioneer Girl. Beth is currently a professor in the MFA program in creative writing at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she's joining us from Madison tonight. Welcome, Beth. Hi, thanks for having Th me here. Th thank you all so very much, especially since you are on later time zones and all of us are <laughs> So I know we may be keeping you up a little late tonight, but we so appreciate your time and joining us. <laughs> uh, yes, and Rakesh has got his key. He's gonna yes. stay late tonight. <laughs> So I'd like to throw out a question for all of you just to get uh, just to get started here. It's been a really tough year this last year for I think everybody, um, probably around the world. Um, and I imagine we are no different. Um, so I just want to check in with you all and I'm let's start talking about food right away. Has there been one food that has either been something that you've gone to repeatedly um, over the pandemic? Or is there one food experience that you remember that was a special treat sometime over the last year? And um, let's go ahead and start with Rakesh, if you have an idea about that. This is so embarrassing because I feel like we did, the, one of the last things in public I did before lockdown was an Eat Joy event with Natalie <laughs> yes. here in New York where I talked about how I'm obsessed with Starburst minis. And now here I am more than a year later still talking about them. I'm a complete lunatic. Um, but those have been my, actually, this is probably TMI, but I like have to get my blood sugar lower because I think I've literally been eating too much sweet stuff. And I, I don't know if you know what they are, but the Starburst minis are these unwrapped mini Starbursts and they come in a package and you can eat them by the handful. And they're something about the size and the taste and the texture that is just really, really delicious. So that's something I've turned to too many times. And then there's this wonderful bakery in Brooklyn that originated, I think, in our neighborhood in Greenpoint called Ovenly, which ships nationwide. So this is my plug for them. 
but they make just the most delicious baked treats and they have really, really good cupcakes in particular. So those I've unfortunately had more than I should as well. So those have been my comfort foods. Oh, that's wonderful, Rakesh. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. How about you, Beth? Well, I for one am going to find these Starburst minis. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I feel like I've been missing out this entire pandemic and I am now really, really resentful about that. <laughs> Uh, I have been going sort of uh, high and low with my um, pandemic response to food. The, the high part is that I've really gotten into some serious baking of cakes, you know, like patisserie type of uh, like baking. Like really serious. I, I follow <laughs> her on Instagram. Like, let me tell you, like, like if, I mean, if you were on like the Great British Bake Off, I mean, Blow them away. I'm literally <laughs> really? going to follow you right now. I'm pulling it up on my <laughs> because of that show that I just started thinking, you know, you know what is creme pad? I, can I make this? And yes, I can. And so can all of us, actually. And then the more I started doing that, the more complicated it got. And it's just been extremely fun, you know, just to be absorbed in a different art form that is not writing. But on the other side of that, I've also been eating a lot of um, really low quality pizza. Frozen pizza, I mean, the lowest quality you can get is a Totino's, <laughs> um, which I used to buy when I was in college, at, you know, for a dollar. And the price hasn't really changed that much, <laughs> um, which is probably indicative of something. But yes, so I, I eat those late at night. Um, and I, I am a kind of fancy person. So I actually add fennel powder. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I put oh, fennel and like oh, fennel yeah. pollen to my Totino's. Uh, pizza. Love. That is the definition of high low, I think. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> I think we've just hit on that. Yeah. Thank you, Beth. How about you, Natalie? What's your story? <laughs> oh my gosh. I mean, I feel like I've gone like low, medium low. <laughs> like, I don't know. I'm not, I can't compete with, with Beth. And Rakesh, I know you've been making some gorgeous things too, because I've seen some of your food pictures on Twitter, but I feel like a lot of people have like gone gourmet during this time, but I don't know. I mean, this, this might be the same as you, Beth, but you know, I've got two little kids who have been home with me since last March, you know, they're still, we're still chugging along. They're still <laughs> home doing virtual school. So like, I don't have, I have less alone time now than ever before. Um, and so and my cooking has like gotten simpler and like more pared down. And also my body has kind of insisted on that. I don't know, if, like, like that's sort of like TMI, but like, it's like, I ha because of this constant level of stress, like we all have this like threshold and it just doesn't really go away. And my body's like, this is what you have to eat. And so I've been eating um, a lot of like purees, like, you know, I've had, I like had gazpacho every day this summer. I got like creative with my gazpachos. I like looked up like, you know, Mark Bittman, like green gazpacho. And then, you know, I was doing like squash soup in the fall and, you know, my kale soup in the winter. And, but yeah, like all these pureed soups. And also I started having smoothies for breakfast every day. And I'm not going to start talking about smoothies because I literally could talk about smoothies <laughs> for hours <laughs> if you get me started. But yeah, a lot of like very simple like baby food but 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 good <laughs> yeah it's so interesting the, how we define comfort food you know and what our bodies go to during those times wow yeah. thank you thank you all so much so a question for natalie your introduction really beautifully explains how the collection came together and clearly it happened way before the pandemic anything uh, that it, we occurred this last year um given Given what's, what we've all experienced this last year, do you think about this collection differently now? Um, I don't know that I think about it differently, but I feel like I, I feel it <laughs> differently, if, if that makes sense. Um, no, I, I, I mean, it's like, it feels more kind of like achingly relevant, <laughs> um, more achingly relevant than ever. And I, I really feel like revisiting Eat Joy during this period of collective aloneness has been such a source of light for me. So thank you for bringing us together in this way. I feel like, you know, for me during dark times, it helps to be reminded that other people have experienced 
adversity and somehow <laughs> managed to, to make it through and, you know, summon that resilience and, you know, the, and, and maybe we can as well, <laughs> ideally, you know, and that we all experience dark times, but we can still, you know, try to summon that deliciousness along the way. Um, and also just kind of to be reminded that we don't necessarily need to be happy to be joyful. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And I actually want to get your thoughts, all three of your thoughts on that. The, the whole idea of happiness versus joy and, um, and what that might be. Um, Beth, do you have any, have any thoughts about that? Like, it, are they the same thing for you, the idea of happiness and joy, or is there a difference? I think they're very different. Um, for me, I think happiness is quite elusive and joy is not meant to be anything other than temporary and that's why i love it and that's why i will take it like i i, I can't reach for happiness because that seems like a big word to, that seems to imply like an extended length of time but joy is like a burst yeah. and that can that can take me the whole day you know i, I can one burst of joy and i'm that's that's all <laughs> i really need for a, a while or i can like look forward to it all day long you know what i mean yeah i have yeah. i have no expectation of happiness i just want joy yeah. That's really beautiful. That makes me think of um, Rakesh's uh, Starburst Minis. <laughs> a, little, a little burst of joy. But Rakesh, do you have thoughts about that? Is that happiness versus joy? That's a really great question. I mean, I hadn't thought about the distinction, even in light of this book before. By the way, you had mentioned you know, what our bodies go to and like more of what our bodies go through, because I feel like that's in this moment of time, I think that's become so much more acute because we're all relatively sedentary, like we've been cooped up we're not nearly as active as many of us are not nearly as active as we typically were and um i think a lot of that to beth's point uh, the, our just whole sense of time is completely out of whack because um we me it sounds like the musical red but it's like we're measuring things and like the little sort of tasks we perform throughout the day and um i think you know it's just very very easy to forget where those moments are kind of occurring as we're having them and what, um, you know, what we're, really we become our minds. I mean, I found that myself, it's somewhat helpful for writing, I think, or people who are kind of working creatively because it's like you're almost divested of your body in a way because it's become such a weird consideration of sort of energizing it as necessary and treating it like it's a machine. And then you kind of just become your thoughts. And so I think a lot of us have been alone with those thoughts or with, you know, our husbands or partners or whatever in our in, with our thoughts and we're reduced to that and, and a, there's a reduction of sorts but then it sort of like opens up your thinking so i think mm -hmm. that larger sort of macro idea of happiness feels somewhat elusive as beth is mentioning but these moments that you kind of seek throughout the day that give you that jolt mentally in a sense to kind of bring you back to the moment and bring you back to the things that matter and i hope you know that it's when if we emerge from this kind of period that it will help a lot of us to refine what those things are and to refine what we value during this period of time and to get at that point the idea of like what is the long tail happiness you're aiming for and then what is the joy that you're trying to seek in every day and that's a lesson I think a lot of us have probably learned a great deal about this year. Yeah that's beautiful um and Natalie, what about um, joy versus happiness for you and, and your choice of the word joy in the title of this book? What, is, what does that mean to you? Yeah, um, no, I really, I really um, agree with a lot of what Beth was saying and it was kind of heartening to hear that, and, and Rakesh as well, that we sort of, I, I also see, I kind of associate happiness with kind of ease maybe and, and, and mm -hmm. kind of a steadiness and joy, I also see as kind of fleeting, and and you know, even if you want to hold on to it, you know, it just it'll it dissipates as soon as you you try, you know. But I think, but I think, you know, it's something that we can access during great difficulties, and I think, you know, connection can be joy, and even if it's just you know a moment or you know deliciousness in the midst of sorrow can be joy, and I I think of joy as kind of. Um, this is something I've been thinking about a lot this year, in part because of the new um, book that I'm in the midst of, but I think of joy as kind of representing a, a joining of sorrows and, and a joining of loneliness, and it's that connection. And so 
the title, I mean, maybe I do think about the book in a slightly different way now, I guess, mm -hmm. in the wake of all of this, because it, it I, um, you know, I, I it, it resonates more profoundly, at least. And I think of it as kind of, you know, that bittersweet taste. And Cindy, we talked about that once before, you know, the taste, the taste of resilience and, you know, the deliciousness of still being here, <laughs> despite everything. Yeah, that's very profound. And this concept of deliciousness, I think, is so beautiful. Like, it's such a, it's such a profound and kind of deep one. I'm wondering if Beth or Rakesh, if you want to, if or maybe all three of you, if you could maybe be willing to share like a moment of deliciousness that comes to mind that maybe doesn't have anything to do with food, because I think deliciousness is so much bigger than that. But maybe it does relate to that idea of joy. So. Anybody willing to share a moment of deliciousness? Do you mean during this past year or just any time? In general, how would you connect oh, yeah. with that idea? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's the, fun, the funny thing is the, the first thing that came to my mind when you said that was what, thinking about when I was you know, really young, like seven or eight years old, and my grandmother lived with us. And she was really inter into these giant thousand, five thousand piece puzzles that she would just slowly work on. And when I would sit with her, sometimes we would just very quietly eat fruit and put together this puzzle. And every time you know, I would find a piece and would fit without having to try a bunch, you know, but you just get it right the first time, it would be so satisfying. <laughs> very satisfying. It would make a little sound. And then my grandmother would look over and she'd go, hmm. And like just acknowledging <laughs> how satisfying it was to get it right the first time of all the pieces. And it just didn't happen very often. And that's what came to my mind. It was, it was delicious. Mm, that, yes. that satisfying moment of just getting it right that first time. Oh, that's I think so the, beautiful. It's funny because my mind went immediately to family as well, because I think obviously food is very communal and very familial. And I actually had this thought earlier this week because I you know, my, I haven't seen my parents in, during this whole period of time. And my mom, they live back in the Midwest and my mom is an amazing cook. And, um, and it's funny because my mom is a strict vegetarian. My father eats meat. I grew up eating meat. My husband is a vegetarian. So it's this weird co collaboration, but I made uh, alu mutter, which, which is, you know, peas and potatoes and a, a curry. And, um, and I've been making that a lot during, during lockdown. And it was funny because, you know, like any other, like the soups that Natalie would make, any super stew you make, you know, when it, the day after it typically tastes better because the, the flavors marry and it's richer. And, and I, we were having leftovers of the alu mutter and I really had a kind of sense memory and a kind of delicious moment of thinking, not only did I make this and is it something that I enjoyed eating when I was growing up and I enjoyed my mom's version of it, but knowing I can make it and knowing that I can find comfort in that and that it's continuing and that there are probably slight differences in the way I make it versus the way my mom made it. But the fact that you can create that comfort um, is a really delicious thing. It is, a, it is a kind of moment of coming together. And the other thing I would say too, I've thought about this a great deal because, you know, living in New York, like I love going to the theater in particular and going to a lot of different arts events and live music and art museums, et cetera. And so I really feel like a lot of us, again, not even just being cooped up because we're indoors, but the sensory experience of that is a form of deliciousness that we're missing. And so, and I, I think like a con contrary to what I was saying before, it helps with the writing so much to just be in front of your computer and to kind of imagine the world in front of you and put it in your writing. But that said, there is a lessening of things because that's so stimulating to be, to, to be among other art pieces and to see what people are making. So I think that kind of deliciousness is something we're really going to be literally hungry for when we go out into the world for this. Yes, that is that is great. So how about you, Natalie? Will you share a moment of deliciousness uh, with us that you can think of? For some reason, the first thing that came to mind, um, I'm not sure why. I, we've spent a lot of time out in, in nature during the pandemic, like, a lot, like so many people. Um, is, and where else are we going to go? You know, I mean, I've basically been either in my house since last March or outside. Um, I, I 
really have gone into like a countable number of buildings. I haven't gone inside a restaurant even like to pick up take like I've just been <laughs> I've gone nowhere. But um but then out in the world, you know, every day I go for a run and I take my kids hiking as much, like if I don't they're like puppies, like I have to walk them <laughs> or they don't get outside. And so um and we live uh, right along the Potomac River in Maryland and so um we spend a lot of time hiking along the banks of the river or in kind of trails and uh and that's one of the things that has really helped like keep me afloat, <laughs> like literally keep me afloat, uh, figuratively keep me afloat. And, and it's been especially healing. But I was thinking we, um, we last spring we developed this ritual of uh, so at some point on every hike, um, we would rest our, my, my children and I would rest our, our palms, like float them on the surface of the water and and make a wish on the river and i just made this up you know but um as as something you know as a kind of ritual comfort for us and and um and i was just picturing and it's been it's actually and then we did it all through the summer and um it, sometimes you know we'd, we'd be on a trail that was farther from the river and we'd have to find a spot that we could get down a steep bank so you know my son you know he had to make his wish on the river and um and then you know, fall came and then, you know, by December, I was like, I don't want to put my hands in the river. And my son was so sad, like, we need to make our wish. How is it going to come true if we don't put our hands on the river? And I was like, we can pet the moss, you know, we can like, just try to come up with other things. But I was just thinking about how, you know, the deliciousness of finally being able to put my, my float my hands on top of the river again, now that it's getting yeah. warm. Oh, that's so beautiful. I can tell all three of you are very gifted writers because those moments that you were describing are so palpable to me. Like they're so real and you encapsulated them. I love the sensory. Um, I'm really taken also with this idea. Beth mentioned earlier when she was introducing herself that she's gotten into another art form um, during this time, which is cooking. And um, Rakesh was saying, you know, missing the all the art and stimulation that he normally has living in New York. I'm wondering, is there a particular art form that either you have particularly missed during this time or that you found yourself um, becoming more interested in in some way or even trying out yourself? I'm really interested in what you're all obviously writers um, and you do that, but are there other things that are also helping to feed that for you? Maybe Rakesh, anything comes to mind for you? Well, the cooking is true. That, that is, I guess, um, Natalie mentioned this, and it's true. I've always enjoyed cooking, and but it has become a real, it, it, I mean, for, I think for many, many people, it's become a kind of complete refashioning of the way of thinking about the way the food looks for the week. And so, yeah. um, you know, for the better part of, the, of this pandemic, um, and I really like cooking. That's the funny thing. It's like sometimes my husband is like, are you okay doing all the cooking? I'm like, no, I really, I find it very calming. Some people find it stressful. I find it very centering to, to, to cook. And I, to Beth's point, baking can be very, very comforting because it's the exactitude of it can be very kind of um, warm and, and inviting to kind of have that order and that, that, that available to you. But it has been, um, and it's been frankly, when you live in New York and you're working crazy hours and you're running to the next thing, it's very frugal. <laughs> like I forget in a way, like living in a big city, like if you just really were under the confines of cooking at home more often than not, and having that, not only is it comforting, but you just sort of like, wow, this is a real reset of the way that I think about how I eat, how, what, how the day is structured. Um, and I think the other thing too, is that um, there's something really, uh, I like the idea of cooking. I like the process of cooking because, and I, I write about this a bit in the piece in the book, which is all of, you can see all of your work. It's like you do everything. And it's one of the few things where all of the work that you've done is literally right in front of you. And it feels very fulfilling to think, you know, I spent all this time, I put it all in here. I can see it, I can taste it, mm -hmm. I can feel it in a certain way. And that is itself, I think a really um, lovely process to go through. So that's definitely been, been, been one of them. And I think, um, the, I mean, I love to draw and I started doing that a bit at the beginning of the pandemic too, but I think some weird psychosomatic thing happened where I would get near to the end of a drawing and then, and not finish it being like, if I finish this, I, that spectrum of time is still elusive. I don't understand what that, where that I am in this, 
like maybe I'll keep it unfinished because we'll be out of this soon and then that'll be a sign that, you know, I was never as trapped as I thought I was. <laughs> this weird thing. So, anyway. <laughs> well, thank you so much for that. Beth, do you have thoughts about art, either the, the cooking you've gotten into or other forms of it? I miss art museums so, so much. Oh, I can, oh, yes. Um, I've always found them to be very soothing places and places where of transformation. So not getting to go anywhere, I just sort of go to my kitchen and I've thought about this, like, is, is it art if you just eat it? You know, like, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I've really gotten into very fiddly baking. Like the most fiddly thing is the thing I want to do. And it's probably because, you know, like, I would knit if I could, but I'm really bad at it. And I just, why try? I'm just so bad at it. everything I knit turns into chain mail. So I'm going to bake and I want to do really tiny fiddly little fondant flowers. I want to make um, cookies and then ice them very, very intricately. You know, I made a, a gingerbread house, a modern gingerbread house from scratch. And it's still, actually, we still have it. It's still in my dining room because my, my younger son says we cannot get rid of it. He, he's like, let's just keep it till next, <laughs> till next it's December. It's gorgeous. It's like, and it's, it's like totally fine. Yeah. Some of the candy is falling off, but the rest of it is like structurally sound, you know, but it's like, <laughs> but the very fiddly little decorating stuff. I just, I get into a zone and uh, it feels like I'm doing something that is doable, which to me is the opposite of writing. The writing goes on forever. I'm never sure when the writing is done almost never someone has to just like take it from me you know or say you're done basically like i will edit a document forever if someone doesn't just like cut off my access to it basically but with a base good there's only so much you can do and then it has to be done and then you can eat it <laughs> or, or look at it and so i feel like that's like doable you know and so satisfying so it's like an it's an art form that i can enter in a way and almost like quote unquote succeed at in a way that I, that doesn't feel to me as associated with frustration and like uncertainty uh, the way writing often does. And that, you know, when the day is over, I have something that I can enjoy and the other people around me can enjoy. And if I don't love it, if it didn't, the bake didn't work out, guess what? You just try it again. No big deal. The revision process is also just like fun and easy. Same thing. And uh, I find it that just a very satisfying way to approach art and in a joyful way. I wow. feel like we're all living in that gingerbread house. I think mean, you just created the metaphor <laughs> for the past year that we've been through. I have gumdrops falling off my head. Like, like I feel like we're, <laughs> we're all living in that house. We should be so lucky as to be in her gingerbread house. So that would be great. Natalie, thoughts from you about art and about um, how you're thinking about that right now? Um, yeah, although I have to say, I want I want the Rakesh Beth like cooking show. So if you guys <laughs> yeah. can get on that, please. <laughs> um, I can't wait to watch. Uh, but in terms of art, um, I mean, I also have, have found like, great refuge in cooking. Although I'm not doing the um, elaborate creations of Rakesh, maybe or the intricacies of, of that. I'm, I just I, I don't have I don't have time, and I don't have the patience, and also. I really, I don't like a baking for its exactitude. I don't, I just don't approach it that way, but I understand why, why, why one would and perhaps should. <laughs> I just, I just can't. I, I, I like physically, I, like, like my like rebel heart is just like, no, like I have to, I, I, even if it's, even if it's literally my own recipe and I do have my, like I used to do this recipe column. So I have recipes like, you know, posted online and I'll be able to be like, what's that, you know, lentil soup that I did for that thing. And I'll, you know, go to the, you know, the website I used to do uh, recipes for the hairpin. So I pull up the hairpin and find my recipe. And then I'm like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. Like I can't, I'll like follow it. And then I have to like, I'm like, what's the thing that I'm going to innovate today? Like I, I just, I can't follow follow a recipe, but um, my mom would go crazy. Like she was an economist, you know, everything, like, you know, follow the rules. But, um, but for me, it's all about experimentation. Like, what can I, how much can I get away with? Like, can I put like, let's put sweet potato in this. Like, it doesn't have sweet potato. Like, we're just going to do it anyhow. And as long as you're willing to eat your mistakes, I feel like it's fine. Like I made these donuts, I made these baked donuts the other day and I tried out, 
this is, I went too far. See, I do go too far, but it was, <laughs> they were like mint chocolate donuts. I was just really craving them. I'm like, I'm just going to make them. And I did. And I baked them. Like, it's totally easy. It's not like at Beth Nguyen's level. Like I didn't do what, like you well, Everybody do. enjoys like, deep frying as much as I do. <laughs> <laughs> I no, I don't even have any, like, I just, I just have like this cheap, like, you know, donut pan that I, whatever. But, um, but I did use, I didn't use any sugar in them. It was this experiment. Actually, it was really pretty good. I mean, and then I glazed them in mint chocolate. So that was like tons of sugar. But um, I don't know, sometimes the top note, I feel like is all you really need. Like it's just that top, you know, the, the sweetness and the Christmas and you get that and then, but anyhow, but you were asking really about art and I've gone on a, a donut <laughs> tangent. <laughs> I think you're talking about art in a way, yeah. Um, but um, I actually really think of myself as as a painter more than anything else. As, um, my, I have some anxiety of even thinking of myself as a writer, and, and honestly, sometimes even as an editor. But although I love it, but um, but I was I was trained as as a painter, and that's like my first. Well, no, actually, it's not my first love. I, writing was my first love, but but painting was then the love that I pursued. Uh, and, and I haven't really been able to paint during the pandemic, which has been like such, so it's not something I've rediscovered. It's something that I've, I feel like I've lost, but, um, but just in the past couple of weeks, I feel like I'm, I'm starting to find my way back. And I'm, I started a few paintings that actually are close to being done. I just small, I figured I could do handle small things while my kids are upstairs on their Zoom calls and having their technical breakdowns and calling me back up. But, um, but yeah, so I've, I'm, I'm, I'm making my way home to it. I, I hope, I'm trying, <laughs> I'm trying to get there. Yeah, that's an interesting idea of making your way home to it. And, and yeah, and Rakesh saying he didn't want to finish his drawings, you know, and you're starting these little paintings. It's, yeah, very, very interesting. Well, Beth and Rakesh, um, your stories both have similar themes, your stories from each. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you hoped for readers to get out of your stories, if, if you had the desire for readers to take something away from it. Um, what that might be. Uh, Rakesh, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I think a, a theme in a lot of my work, I mean, it, it's funny, I was just speaking to a college class earlier today about my first book, which is um, kind of dovetails very much with this piece in a way, because it's, you know, that book is about kind of young child, young kind of queer child trying to make his way in the world and come to terms with himself and, and think about the challenges that he's faced with and how he's going to process those and sort of move through them. And the, the word that I think about a great deal, which I think a lot of us have thought about during this period of time is resilience. The idea of um, having challenges that you have to uh, sift through and no, no baking pun intended, um, and, and kind of come to the other side of, and to take stock emotionally of what you have available to you that helps restore some of those uh, key parts of yourself and to uh, really, take those challenges and make something concrete of them. I mean, it kind of goes back to what I was saying, and that's in the piece is, you know, I baked pies a lot growing up because I love that idea of having my work in front of me, having something I could control. Um, and they're delicious, obviously, but I love the idea of like something being sensory and inviting and comforting that I had created and that, that I then, then replenished me. And I think um, not that that was all happening consciously as I was growing up, but I think in retrospect, I can understand what that role that was playing in my life. The idea that that activity was providing me some form of solace that I could not even quite process at that point in time. So I think that's really what I wanted readers to take away from it, um, is the idea that sometimes the practice of something, the physical practice of something is a solution. And I think... Uh, what I like about cooking and baking and all of those things put together is that they're cerebral, but they're not necessarily taxing. They, they, take a focal, they take a focal point to accomplish them and they take focus on your part to do them. And they can be sort of methodical and they can be, and you're using a constant sort of analysis of what's going on, but it doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be depleting in any way. And so I think, 
that's the parallel I was trying to draw of these, you know, when I was bullied as a kid or when I had difficult, a difficult time coming to terms with my identity or my sexuality, those things as I was growing up, the idea that I could do artistic things that expressed an element that I found to be myself and just the practice of that and the proof that I saw in that was the thing that carried me through. So that was really the, the thing I was trying to get at in the piece. That's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Beth, how about you? I just want to say that that totally resonates with me and really makes sense to me. It made me think about how so many writers are runners. Like that's just, that's a really mm. thing. And I'm not, but I under, started to understand why when I was started to bake. You know, it's yeah. like that zone. You get, you get something done in your thought process when you're doing, when you're focusing on something else like that. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, yeah, my, you know, my childhood was, was not dissimilar in that it's, that I had a lot to figure out in terms of identity. And you know, my, my family came here from Vietnam as refugees and I was a baby at the time. And we ended up growing up, we ended up being settled in Michigan, which is where I grew up. And it was a, it was a strange place to grow up, I think, for a, a you know, Vietnamese refugee girl who was surrounded by people who were definitely not uh, other refugees mostly. And there was just a lot of conflict, basically. And um, childhood in general is like a site that I'm always interested in because there's so much we don't get to control. Uh, it's, there's so much we don't even think about controlling because things are chosen for us. And growing up is kind of like that process of under, understanding that and figuring out what we actually want and what informs that idea of want or longing, and then reckoning with that for the rest of our lives that, you know, what we were given and then what we learned to want or learn to, uh, you know, take for ourselves in all the weird uh, uses of those words. And, you know, the, I wrote about spaghetti because one of the you know, first things that I loved was the spaghetti sauce commercials you know, ragu and prego. And I just thought that that has got to be the, you know, the greatest thing ever. They're very alluring commercials. <laughs> and, um, and then I just, that's all I ever wanted was to eat yeah, spaghetti, like regular plain, like nothing fancy. We, ne we never even had the, the cheese, you know, what was that cheese called? The, the cheese that you could shake. Parmesan. The craft yes, Parmesan. Yes, the, the, the very packaged though. You know, the green Yeah, the can. green yeah. can. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was just too fancy. So we never even had that. But I didn't. I didn't even care. I just wanted that ragu or that prego on, you know, that bed of noodles, and then you get to mix it up together. It was just this whole process, and then I just thought, okay, this is what this is like my pursuit, spaghetti, mm -hmm. for years and years. And then as I got older, I learned to make my own spaghetti sauce, basically, and you know, left the ragu behind. <laughs> and that's like my recipe. It turned out to be like the basically the, the the tomato sauce that I learned to make slowly over the years, and I associate very much with. I still do this, you know, eating alone late at night after everyone has gone to sleep. After my kids have gone to sleep, I'll just like make some for myself, and I do that because when I'm entirely alone, I don't, you know, have to share with anybody, and I, that sounds kind of weird because, but. I don't know how to eat food without sharing it with the person, with anybody who's around me. You know, it just, it's like immoral in my view. But if everybody's asleep, no problem. <laughs> like, so what are we going to do, wake them up? If they're asleep, then there's no burden even to think about. And it just feels, you know, it feels like selfish in an okay way. Yeah, absolutely. So Thinking about your childhoods, it, I, I really, I love how much that was a theme in a lot of the stories in this book and, and really how food shaped that and the family relations. And I have to say that Beth, your, your recipe for spaghetti was one of the least intimidating ones in the book to me. Like I love the story partially because I was like, I could totally do this. And I think also because it gave me permission to think I can eat late at night when no one else is around and I don't have to share it, <laughs> you know? So it was, it was really cool in that way. Were there any, um, I know it's hard to pick favorites, especially for Natalie, but were there any of the stories or any of the moments in the stories um, from this book that really touched any of you from the, from the other writers? Um, anything, any of the even visuals um, 
or moments that really stood out to you as, as something that you're gonna you're gonna hang on to. Um, Natalie, I'll start with you. And again, I know it's hard to, to pick any favorites out of this amazing collection you pulled together. But I'm just curious. If there's anything no, I mean, there. You know, at some level, they're <clears throat> they're truly all my favorites. Otherwise, you know, they wouldn't they wouldn't be here. But um, I mean, the line that immediately jumped to mind when when you asked was. Um, from Kristen Iskandrian's Grief Pickles, um, in part because Beth was talking about eating alone and she talks about pickles as being the perfect alone food. But the line that honestly, I thought about so much during the pandemic, and I mean, I think I always will have this line that, you know, at heart um, is when she says, um, sometimes you have to celebrate the sadness too. Mm -hmm. And that line just, <laughs> just I really feel that. Sometimes you have to celebrate the sadness. And, and she talks about, you know, eating, how we have to eat the, eating the alone food together. She felt less alone. Although also I feel like I've actually found myself seeking out alone food during the pandemic. So I like what you said, Beth, about how you feel <laughs> in the evening, you can, you have permission to eat alone. Although actually I, I give myself that permission <laughs> during the day as well, <laughs> because I need it. And I, I actually have found myself, and maybe this will sound terrible to you since you're talking about how you feel obligated to share, but I found myself specifically making dishes just for me, like, like, like a, a cake just for one, you know, like even though it, it just, it seems ridiculous, like to take all that like time to make this miniature little thing and put it in the up, like what a wait, but, but it's just like, that might be the only thing that I do alone the whole day, you know? And even if like my kids are rampaging while I'm eating it, it's still, it's, it's all mine, you know, that's, it's my alone. Um, but yeah, celebrating the sadness, it's, I, I, well, I just for the record, I think that's a brilliant thing to do. Make a cake that only you want. I mean, like that's that didn't even occur to me. I think that's such a <laughs> genius. I'm you were missing out. Make it like, and it's just gonna be for me. I love it. I love it, and I think that's that is a great. I mean, they didn't make the personal pan pizza for no reason. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear you. You should do it. Oh, great. How about you, Beth? Any any stories or moments from this book from the other writers that really stuck with you? You know, it's funny because the first thing I thought was Greek pickles, which I loved, but I also really loved the depression pancakes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and just uh, also just the whole idea about it. And I don't know. I the, the interesting thing about it is like when I when I was reading this, I didn't I I didn't make any of the recipes, you know, but I wanted to in a, in a weird way, I never even thought about it. Like making it, actually making a recipe. Yeah. I just like to read the way people show their relationship with food. And the tenderness, um, I guess, the tenderness and the intimacy, the way with, that people use in their wording and their sharing of it. So the homecoming part, I don't know, I found it, it very, very emotional, the whole section. Yeah. But yeah, I love the depression pancakes and um, maybe I should, maybe I should make them. <laughs> you should. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Rakesh? Um, well, I love everything Carmen Machado writes. So I really like that piece, my Meals in My Twenties piece. I was looking up the title because I really enjoyed that piece. And actually, I really like Cora Chista's piece because not only did I enjoy her piece, and we had, actually when we had done an event at Books for okay. Magic in Brooklyn, she had read from that piece. But I don't know if any of you watched the Padma Lakshmi show, Taste the Nation, which is very well done. It's a wonderful yeah. show. Mm -hmm. But they show a, a cook making that rice dish and flipping it, you know, to, to, to show you the process of doing it. It's very satisfying to see that. Because um, I've eaten that dish before, but I don't think I've ever seen somebody make it and actually do the thing where you flip it over and see the burnt bottom that becomes the top. So um, I really enjoyed that. I just have to make an addendum to Beth's story about the ragu and prego, because literally in this class I was speaking to, I was talking to an Asian American studies class at Harvard this afternoon, and we were discussing in my first book, Blue Boy, the character does this whole thing where he thinks he's the reincarnation of Krishna, the Hindu god who in mythology ate a lot of butter. So in this, in this novel, I have this character eating kind of fistfuls of country crock. And one of the stories I got in the class was, why did you choose country crock? And, I, and it was funny because I hadn't, it just seemed like such a logical thing to me because I grew up in the Midwest. You know, the story takes place in the early 90s. It was such a manufactured Midwestern sort of 
faux food, but everybody had it and it was so popular. But it was funny because I found myself trying to explain those country crock commercials from the early 90s. I don't know if you remember them, but if you recall, they were a man and a woman's voice. And I don't know if they were married, if they were lovers, if they were, uh, if they were, if it was soldiers, maybe they were siblings. Like, I don't know what, how <laughs> these people knew each other, but it, they were just their hands. It was like watching, you know, um, it, it or whatever from the uh, oh, monsters, yeah. whatever. Yeah. And so now. it was all hand acting, like hand modeling <laughs> and these people's voices, but even trying to explain to people who may remember, I sounded completely unhinged trying to explain. <laughs> To a group of people who had never seen them before. So if you if you want to entertain slash terrify yourself, please Google country rock commercials and see what you can find because they're very unsettling. I totally <laughs> so, forgot about those. Those those were really strange commercials. They were strange. Who thought of that? They were so strange. What does that have to do with butter? Yeah, I don't know. Like <laughs> oh my god, that's great. That is so funny. <laughs> Um, I just got, I just heard from Chris here, and I guess we should probably turn to some of the questions coming in here. Um, she says, the main question we've been getting is wanting to see best gingerbread house. <laughs> we want to get some, some new Instagram followers, uh, Beth, out of this, if that's where that, that is. So if we can see it on there, that would be cool. Um, but, um, but one other question was actually for Natalie um, about how she chose the name Eat Joy about the different sections of the book and how, how that was kind of decided, those themes, and whether you considered any other titles or ways of organizing the book. Um, I feel like I don't have that exciting an answer for that, but it's a great question. I, I somehow, that was the only name for the book I ever considered. Um, unlike the book I'm working on now, which has just been chaos with names, although I think I think actually it is going to be the, <laughs> the title that I had all along, but um, but then there was some some craziness and then now we're back. But but Eat Joy was always, it was sort of born in my mind as Eat Joy and and the chapters actually also, um, even in the book proposal, I think I, I had a sketch of kind of these chapters. I, I, I expected that the pieces would unfurl in, in the way that they, they did and 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 that these categories would be warranted and I don't know, it, it just felt I don't know I'm, I mean I'm kind of an intuitive person but it just sort of felt right and it, and it seemed to come together that way um, so yeah I, I, I didn't I didn't I really have a different um, I mean the actual essays that, that are in each chapter that that changed up a lot and there were some that I think would have been at home in other chapters as well. And we had to kind of change things up for various messy reasons that are uninteresting, but um, in terms of, you know, with the illustrations and just, you know, making it all fit together in a, in a tidy way. But, but the actual chapter categories and the title, just, this is how I- It was there, yeah. yeah there. Mm -hmm. And Beth, you said earlier that you found homecoming, that section particularly emotional. Um, R Rakesh, did you have any any reactions in that way to the sections of the book? Well, I think it was, um, I think there is a trajectory. I mean, I, I assume, Natalie, this is part of what you were aiming for, is that you kind of go through a trajectory where you're almost, you kind of land in a very soft place, I think, at the end. It sort of feels yeah. comforting in that way. Yeah. Um, but I also think, like, it's such a panoply of voices, too. I mean, that's the exciting, I mean, it's funny, because I feel like when you've written for a period of time, you do, you know, you contribute pieces to things, and nothing's more exciting than seeing what other people took from that prompt, you know? So I think um, that, to me, was the exciting thing, to see how you could just go from piece to piece and people just had such a sense of wildly divergent ways of thinking about this topic. Um, so I really felt that sense, but I think it, the funny thing is, I don't remember the structure as fully because I, I keep the bed nearby me and I picked it up a few times and sort of picked through it and I read it through the first time, but now I just have a sense of like all the different pieces that I kind of flip through. And I think, yeah. I guess in the way that's how a cookbook works, you know, like, like you get a sense of the rhythm of it when you're looking through it, but then, depending on what you're thinking of or what you're feeling at a specific time. Because that's the thing that people have to keep in mind about the book. It's a wonderful book and it is an anthology, but it is a cookbook. Like it is, it has, it has a whole cooking element that even if you, you know, took the stories out, which who wouldn't do that? But if you took them out, you still have all the recipes. So it's really great to have that element. Yeah, that's so cool. That's great. 
Um, well, we're, we're heading towards the end here. I've got a few, uh, few questions here. I hate to wrap up tonight. It's such a joy talking to you all. Um, you want me to go get the gingerbread house? <laughs> we love yes. it, actually. You've got some people who... <laughs> I will if you want. It's, you know, the candy's starting to fall off, but I, I will go get it if you want me to. What? That would be really cool. Right. Okay, I'll I be right ask, back. I can ask back. Natalie a question while you're gone. Right. I'm ready. Natalie, I'm curious, um, one of the questions that came in, let me see, yeah. pull it up right here. Um, did you know all the contributors um, before you put this book together? Or if not, how did, how did you find them? Yeah, no, I did, I mean, I, I befriended a lot of people working <laughs> working on this, which is part of the the loveliness of, of putting together a book like this. Um, so no, I did not. I I my in my previous book, which is um, the Artists and Writers Cookbook. So that book had, I think, seventy six contributors, which wow. like, I'm so glad that the book is in the world because I really I really still quite love it. And I'm also so glad that I never have to do it again <laughs> because I already did it. <laughs> um, but uh, I, each joy I actually felt like I could just keep making forever. I was like, can I, this book just go on? It was, it was so wonderful. And, but uh, the, the cookbook was a little bit unwieldy. <laughs> but um, but there were some of the contributors from, oh my gosh, and there it is. You know what? Literally, really cool. Literally, literally eat your heart out, Frank Lloyd Wright. I actually Wright. just broke <laughs> some of it as I was watching it. I, this was this has been here this whole time and I so I just great. knocked it over and broke it. Whoops. Uh, so as you see, it started to it seemed that, better. That it's is so incredible. Speed. It has seen better times. It's you have a whole yard. You know. Yeah, there's solar panels on the top. Oh my god. There, there's two cats in the window, which are our cats. So yeah, oh and my like god. we really enjoyed doing that chimney. Which is candy made out of candy. I have never seen a modernist um, gingerbread house before. So this is this is something entirely edible. And these are made out of fondant. And these are pine cones, also made out of fondant. Oh my goodness! Wow. Well, this goes were actually on a, on a Yule log that I had made. <laughs> so, you know, my kids just did not want to throw away the pine cones. So yeah. yeah so this is like our falling down house. It's getting it's getting raggedy. Needs some repairs. Needs some real renovation. Yeah, but spring cleaning, maybe. You got to do some spring cleaning. No, but. can't you like lacquer it in some sort of enamel so it never rots and it just lives forever? Like it's, it's. Yeah, really? Can I just put it through like the laminating machine? <laughs> 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 but like, yeah, this is so <laughs> much. We appreciate seeing that. I know we have some happy uh, attendees who. <laughs> Your, your public was clamoring to see <laughs> the cookie art. So, um, and thank you, Natalie, for telling us about all the contributors and that, yeah, you made some friends and you, you actually want to keep going with that. Yes. Um, the final question I guess I have for all of you, um, is there a book, um, either something from a long time ago or, or recently that has helped you get through difficult times? Um, maybe the first thing that you think of with that um, maybe also a comfort read is maybe a way to say that. Um, but, and also, can you tell um, our audience tonight what you are writing right now and, and what we can expect um, from you coming out? So, um, Natalie, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, let's see. I mean, a comfort read from, from the past that I've revisited is definitely, that I'm always revisiting is uh, To the Lighthouse. Virginia Woolf to the Lighthouse is like my old, my old friend, Virginia. Um, and, but uh, more recently, just over the, the course, this course of this year, um, you know, I really love The Book of Delights by Ross Gay. And, you know, it's little vignettes. You can kind of just take it a, a little bit here and a little bit there. And I've kind of been saving it so that I, it doesn't have to end ever. Um, and I recently read uh, Catherine May's Wintering, which is another one that seems pretty perfect for um, this moment in time. And I have to get, I have to, I know you just said one book, but I have to mention Peter Ho Davies's book because I just oh, read that a few days ago. Finally, his, his latest book, um, A Lie Someone Told You About Yourself. Mm -hmm. Am I saying, I think I'm saying that right. Which I loved so much and found so heart expanding. And I actually have not been able to read novels during the pandemic, which is really strange. 
for me, but um, I mean, maybe it's just maybe it's just not even the pandemic, and I just am really drawn to essays and, and memoir right now, which is fine. But um, but I really loved his book, uh, and so I, I I really recommend that. Um, but as for my work, um, well, if you're looking for a book that's you know akin to to E Joy, then I gently recommend <laughs> my previous book, uh, which is the Artist and Writer's Cookbook. And it's also, um, it's ostensibly a cookbook. It's, you know, the large format kind of cookbook style, but it's story driven. And, um, and it encompasses some of the same contributors as Eat Joy. So I did have some, some previous friends who, you know, Miley Malloy was in that as well, and Anthony Doerr and um, Edward Danticat uh, and um, Julia Alvarez and, and Unfortunately, not Rakesh and Beth, so, you know, you can't have everything, but, but if you like to enjoy, then, then the Artists and Writers Cookbook might speak to you, too. Uh, and then as for what I'm working on currently, um, I am working on a book called Lonely Together, which is a collection of personal essays honoring the experience of being alone. Um, and the book was kind of presciently, almost like eerily presciently born before the pandemic. Um, but it feels, definitely feels more um, kind of urgent now. So that's what wow. I'm in the midst of and it will be out um, next April with Catapult. Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Beth, how about you? Well, one of the books I have read most recently that I would like to recommend is a collection of short stories by Dantil Moniz. It's called Milk, Blood, Heat. Mm -hmm. And I, I absolutely love that. Beautiful. Uh, just something I've been thinking about a lot. Mm -hmm. But the comfort, one of my comfort reads is kind of bleak. It's The Grapes of Wrath. And <laughs> as I, I was just realizing, maybe that's why I like depression pancakes. <laughs> I, I really like bleak landscapes. Uh, and I find them comforting. I don't know what that means exactly, but yes, I've read that book many, many times. I also like to read historical fiction when I'm needing comfort, so I will sometimes turn to a book like Wolf Hall, which also is kind of bleak, and, but just to get completely immersed in a different landscape. Yeah. That's, what I, that's what I crave. And um, what I'm working on now is a book of essays, which is like a, basically a memoir in essays. It's called Owner of a Lonely Heart. And it is sort of a sequel to Stealing Buddha's Dinner, which is my first book. But it's, it's much more about my mother and my relationship with my mother. And I didn't meet my mother or know very much about her until I was uh, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. And just sort of, it's sort of about her and about, you know, the concept of motherhood and actually about how very little time that I've spent with my mother and sort of what that means in terms of the consequences of war and trauma and you know living, living in the United States. Mm, wow, thank you. Rakesh, how about you? I just want to point out I believe Depression Pancakes was the original title of The Grapes of Wrath. Um, so, uh, <laughs> <laughs> little known fact. Actually, little known may, fact. May, maybe they were de depression hoe cakes. I can't remember. It depends <laughs> what part of the country you're in. Um, but uh, <laughs> I am. I'm actually. I just today started rereading. I feel like I've read this book so many times over the course of my life. But the last time I read it was probably more than a decade ago. And I ordered a copy off Bookshop because I just thought I had been so long, and I love this book so much that so I'm I'm reading The Westing Game for the first time in a really long time. So if anybody knows that book, it's a it's published, I think, in 1979 by Ellen Raskin. It's a really wonderful YA um, mystery, murder mystery book. And it, I, was, I always loved murder mysteries growing up. I loved Sherlock Holmes. And I loved it just throughout my life. But that was the book I think I read earliest that just, uh, I just fell in love with. So um, I'm reading that, and that's very comforting. Um, and, and I have to say, I just read the new Katsuo Ishiguro, which is so perfect for this period of time. I think the, the whole kind of existential question about life and loneliness and God and resilience and all those things. It's just so well done in that book as usual. So I really enjoyed that. Um, and then the thing I'm working on now is I'm, um, without going into too much detail, but I'm working on uh, 
a book that's set in a high school uh, where there's kind of a racial incident that happens um, and the main character is an English teacher and it's sort of about kind of the idea of being teaching young people in this kind of shifting political landscape we're in and how whether or not literature is a source of comfort when that's the case and who really is learning from whom. So that's kind of the, the when I'm trying to impart what humor I can as I typically try to do my writing, even though we're all in the throes of this very uh, kind of difficult time. So that's, that's what I've been working on. So Natalie, this process of working on this, uh, working on this piece for this book and talking about this book has been very helpful for that process. So that's, that's been great. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you all so very much. We're so excited to see these new works coming out from you. And I know I will be following them and we will get some copies at the library as well. So um, yeah, thank you all. Um, I do need to wrap up. I'm so sad. <laughs> Enjoyed the last hour so much. I know you all are probably waiting to go to bed because it's late at night on the East Coast. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you to all the attendees who stayed with us. Um, we do have some raffle winners here. Um, Chris, do you want to tell us who we've got to have won our raffle here? Uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, Alma Grant, uh, Carol Roach, uh, Donna Maz. Uh, Gloria Bradley Sapp, uh, Richard Kalish, Linda Onstad, uh, Maela Jimenez, and Veronica Macapagal. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. So I will I will contact them uh, tomorrow about picking up their prizes at the various branches. So. Very good. Thank you so much. Everything's better with a raffle, I think. So I've enjoyed this evening so much. Um, thank you all again for being part of this project. Thank you, Natalie, for um, writing this book and for being such a great partner in this with the library. And for Beth and Rakesh, it's just a pleasure to meet you both. And I'm so grateful for the time you've spent with us. Um, with that, I will bid everyone a good night and a thank you for uh, Alameda County Reads. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.